Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. The work that uh, I'm presenting today is on Bayesian analysis, combining Bayesian analysis and uh, optimization for service delivery. And um, the uh, motivation is we would like to, for example, uh, uh, redistribute the resources that we have in service delivery to get better profit or better objective functions. An objective function can be profit or it can be a customer satisfaction or combined measure of those. And uh, this is a work that I've done in IBM uh, as a summer intern. Um, so the mo motivation is uh, that the service delivery companies are the companies that provide some service to other companies. For example, it can be a software implementation, it can be consulting, and they usually have a deadline uh, that they should finish the project by that deadline. They have a revenue size estimation and um, they usually keep the information, historical information, in databases for accounting, billing, and stuff like that. There are many uh, uh, databases on the employees that worked on a project at certain time and what did, uh, they did, and they have information on the ranking of the employees or, uh, for example, on the skills that uh, the employee has. And uh, th those are, uh, all these databases are available. And we would like to be able to use these databases to um, um, increase some objective function and make uh, the service delivery system better. Um, so for example, uh, an, uh, an example of a database is um, uh, the claims over of employees. So they usually, companies keep the track of what employee claimed uh, a, a certain amount of time working on a project. They have month, year, project ID, employee ID that worked on it. Uh, and if we combine this database with the database for employees, we can get information of the about the rank of the employee, if the employee working as a project manager on certain project or not, and stuff like that. So the question is, um, we want to be able to extract levers that affect uh, the objective function that we, want, we would like to maximize. For simplicity, we assume that we want to maximize the profit that, uh, um, that a project makes. And uh, to do that, to extract those levers, uh, we need to learn a causal model uh, about uh, the attributes that affects the, uh, affects the objective function, our objective function. And then after learning this causal model, we would like be, to be able to tune uh, the attributes that are tunable, um, and we would we can, for example, use that tuning information to increase the profit or the objective function that we would like to increase. So this is uh, the basic idea. Uh, so uh, the examples of uh, the attributes that we uh, use in this system are, for example, the percent of time that. Uh, a project manager works in certain projects. Or another uh, example of an attribute is skill diversity. So the average number of skills that an employee works on that project has or used on that project. Uh, there are many interesting attributes and we usually get these, uh, uh, get, uh, at the beginning we got uh, a set of attributes that are suggested by experts, business department. And they suggested that they guessed that these attributes would affect the profit or the overall functionality uh, of a certain system. And another attribute is connection index, which, is, um, which shows how, sol uh, how solid the uh, team is. And that's, for, uh, for example, here is the average number of projects that team members collaborated pre previously. So if they work together or if they uh, used to work separately, so there are many attributes. I'm going to explain the um, attributes that we find out that affects the, our um, objective function later on in this uh, presentation. But this is the basic idea. So we had a huge set of attributes that we started with. And we got those attributes from the databases. And we would like to see how they affect our objective function and if we can tune it to get 
uh, better results. So uh, the goal, uh, our goal uh, here is to develop a framework for uh, both first uh, identifying uh, the uh, attributes that affect um, uh, various staffing factors that affect the service, uh, service delivery. For example, we would like to know if, for example, uh, a project, uh, the time that project managers put on a certain project affect the profit. And if it does, then we can, for example, change it in future. For uh, future projects, we can, for example, uh, make them more involved or less involved and get a better result. And uh, another, after identifying those staffing factors, um, we would like to be able to optimally assign our resources, the limited resources of staffs, to, um, to different projects that are concurrent projects that a company works on. And uh, we would like to, uh, in that uh, part, we would like to satisfy some local and global constraints. The local, uh, uh, an example of a global constraint is the number of employees that are available at that time. We would like to distribute them among the projects. They each have certain skills. Each project needs certain skills. And we have some um, global constraints like that. And the local constraints, for example, is we need to uh, uh, satisfy a deadline. So a project has a deadline, and uh, it's important for customer satisfaction that we meet that deadline. So those are the local constraints that we had on each project. We would like to combine those two and get a better result on uh, the project quality uh, or another, any other objective function. And what we did here is we, did, we built a prototype system uh, that shows what is the potential benefits of having this uh, uh, using Bayesian network and optimization, um, combining these to get uh, uh, to increase the objective function or to get a better objective function. Uh, so, for simplicity, from this point on, I assume that uh, the objective function that we wanna uh, uh, we want to uh, maximize the gr a gross profit ratio, which is the difference between the, pro uh, the, between the revenue that a project makes minus the cost over the revenue size. And, um, and that's the objective function that we would like to maximize. And uh, we use a s set of concurrent projects that start at the same month. And we would like to redistribute our staffs, uh, the set of staffs that we have. Uh, among those projects. Uh, we can generalize this. Actually, uh, uh, I, at the end, I show a generalization of this that uh, remove the constraint of the staffs that we have. We, uh, one of the scenarios that I show here is when we have a pool of employees and we want to redistribute them, di distribute them among different projects. Another example is when, for example, you uh, want to hire new employees or you can um, get subcontractors uh, so you don't have any constraint on the number of employees and you want to get the optimal set of employees for those projects to get the best profit. Uh, okay, for the first part which is learning the attributes and how they affect the objective function, we use the historical data from the IBM's um, IT consulting business. And uh, we used the, that data uh, to get our attributes. And then uh, we used those attributes to learn the Bayesian network, causal Bayesian network, uh, that uh, shows us how these different, how these different attributes affect our uh, objective function. And then uh, from the, that historic data, we extract the relevant attributes that are suggested by experts. And some of them will, uh, would turn out to be irrelevant, and some of them would be more relevant to what we want to learn. And then we build a causal model, causal Bayesian network, um, to identify items that can be changed or affected, uh, or can, can change the quality measure. Or um, by quality measure, here I mean gross profit ratio. And uh, we learn this model. And in the second part, which is the optimization part, the first part is the learning, and the second part, which is the optimization part, we um, use 
some global and local constraints, and we model uh, those with um, LP with linear programming, and uh, we uh, use those constraints um, to uh, tune the various va attributes, uh, various, various staffing factors that affect our objective function to improve that. So um, now I'm going to explain about the, our methodology, the first part. So uh, what we did is we got a set of attributes from the experts. And um, then um, we learned a causal Bayesian network from that. So the first step is to analyze the factors and learn a model. We use Bayesian networks. A Bayesian network is actually, I'm not uh, sure if you're familiar with it, but Bayesian network is a way to model um, uh, a joint probability distribution of a set of variables. And it has a graphical, uh, it, it has a graphical um, uh, figure. And uh, it's usually, um, in a Bayesian network, you can see the independence relation between uh, the set of variables that you have uh, uh, lo uh, by looking at the graphical model. Uh, you can see the independence uh, relation and dependence uh, 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 probability of two variables in the model. So that's the Bayesian networks, uh, and it's a factored way to uh, 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 it's a factor way to um, represent a joint probability distribution of a huge set of variables. Um, then uh, our objective is, uh, as I already said, uh, to identify the levers that affect the objective function, and we want to use those levers for achieving better objective. And we use Bayesian networks because they are well developed, and there are many tools uh, available for that. There are many inference and learning methods for Bayesian networks that shows uh, promising results uh, in different areas. They're really easy to interpret. If you look at the graphical networks, you'll see what variable are independent from uh, other probabilistically. And it's, uh, it's really easy to incorporate prior knowledge. For example, if you know that some variable has some prior probability distribution, you can add that to the Bayesian network e easily. And uh, it's easy to handle partial knowledge. Um, and a Bayesian network is usually, the graphical structure is uh, uh, directed a cyclic graph. And uh, in a Bayesian <coughs> network, you represent the probability. Um, let me show the slide that I have for Bayesian network. So uh, a Bayesian network is, uh, is a, uh, uh, directed a cyclic graph. And um, uh, it's a probability graphical model to represent the joint probability distribution of a set of variables. And you, in this graph, instead of, um, uh, instead of having a table for the joint probability distribution of all the variables, you just multiply the probability of each node given its parents. And that will give you, it's a factored way to represent the joint. So. Uh, Instead of having a big table for n variables, you have small tables for small tables or small probability distributions that can be continuous or Gaussian. And uh, you have a small table for probability of each node given its parents. And the nodes that doesn't have parents has uh, priors. And then uh, there are many methods to do inference in Bayesian networks. For example, if you want to find a a marginal probability of a node, you can sum over other variables, and there are methods to do that fast. And um, uh, so they're very well developed, and there are many inference algorithms for, uh, for uh, getting a probability, um, posterior or marginal probability of a node in Bayesian network. So this is the background on Bayesian networks. And OK, so the second part of the methodology is after learning the Bayesian network, we treat each project as an instance of the network. And then we have a project. We have the parameters of Bayesian network. I'm going to show how it works. Um, uh, we treat that project as an instance of that network. And then we use an optimization method 
at the end to get an optimally to, re, uh, to distribute our limited resources, it can be staffs or it can be other resources, money or stuff like that, uh, uh, to over this set of projects to maximize the global objective function. Uh, for that we have, yes. Yeah, actually, yes. So uh, in that network, we have a node for project type. So the parameters given that node will be different. So it's actually the parameters for different project types are different. So we have 10 different project types. So each one has its own set of parameters. But the whole Bayesian network is single. We just add a node for project types that can, so that will affect the No, no, no. The causal. Actually, okay. What we did in this project, we tried two different approaches. We first tried to, uh, because there are ten different types of projects that they want to know how they, uh, how, for example, they affect each other. Uh, we uh, we used two techniques. So first, we tried to learn different Bayesian networks for for each project for each project type, and then use that to maximize the uh, profit that we want to maximize on those uh, subcategories. Uh, then, uh, in addition to that, in uh, parallel to that, we learned a big Bayesian networks for a whole set of projects. We added a node for project type. So the independence, uh, so in the big Bayesian networks, the independence relations would be the same because the graphical model is the same. But the parameters is given, so each uh, the parameter is given the parent. So that project time can be the parent of any node. So the parameters for any node can be different for uh, different project types. We used both systems, and the second one, when we learned the big Bayesian networks, works much better than the first one. So that's why we used that one. Okay. Uh, what project type of parent of every node? No, actually, I'm going to show that. Okay, good. It's parents of some. Uh, and that was really interesting because we can see the, uh, what knows the project site affects and what doesn't. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, this is the, uh, now I'm going to start talking about model learning, how we learn the model. So, as I told you, uh, we start with a set of project attributes, and those are the inputs that we got from experts. Uh, the attributes we started with ten, and it grew. Uh, we, we consulted with different people in business departments, and it grew to thirty. But it turns out that m m some of them, actually most of them, were irrelevant. And the set of attributes that affects the gross profit ratio will show. I will show and talk about them later in the next slides. And uh, we. Um, so how we find out and that an attribute is irrelevant, uh, but is by looking at the network when we get a network that is disconnected, it's, um, uh, it's not connected, then we say, see that the part that is not affecting uh, the, uh, our final goal, which is the gross profit ratio, we find that irrelevant and we throw it away. And uh, so we had a set of attributes and we extract that, extract that for uh, projects, um, uh, for historical data from the databases. And then we learned the structure of the Bayesian network. Uh, we used the Bayesian network toolbox of Kevin Murphy. Uh, uh, and we modified it for two reasons. Because we added an algorithm that improved uh, the edge orientation. Uh, the Bayesian network toolbox of Kevin Murphy first tries to learn, to learn the structure without directions. And then it orients the edges. I'm going to explain how it orients the edges, but we improved the edge orientation. And also, we added a part to accept prior knowledge, because we had some prior knowledge that we got from business departments. And we, want, we wanted to incorporate that into our Bayesian network. And um, so we, uh, we could add prior knowledge. For example, an example of prior knowledge is that the gross profit ratio, which is the node that we want to maximize, we want it to be an effect. The Bayesian network usually doesn't have any semantics. It's uh, if we have a set of variables, we can a Bayesian network from it. But the one that we use is a causal Bayesian network. When we 
uh, we can enforce a Bayesian network to be causal by adding this semantic to the Bayesian networks. And by adding that, I mean that, for example, we want the profit ratio to be a cause node. We don't want a profit ratio to be a parent of another node. That's the node that we want to maximize, and we, we want it to be the last node in uh, the ordering of our, in the total ordering of our um, Bayesian network. So we added those information. We also want, for example, to the project type to be a parent node of everything. So we want it to be uh, the first node in our uh, ordering. Um, and those are the prior knowledge that, I, uh, that we incorporated in our Bayesian network. And then, actually, at the beginning, what we did, we didn't add any prior knowledge. We learned the networks, and it didn't work very well. And uh, we got some prior knowledge. We had those prior knowledge. We tested both. Uh, we had some prior knowledge. We incorporated that, and it's really increased the, um, uh, increased the, uh, it worked really well. And um, uh, increased the accuracy. And, um, for that, um, uh, I'm going to talk about those prior knowledge later. And then we learn the uh, parameters of the Bayesian network. We assume that I'm going to uh, show you the uh, nodes, but uh, our nodes is continuous. And uh, we assume that they're Gaussian nodes. That's the assumption that we put. And we learn the parameters after learning the structure from the data. And then we perform tenfold cross-validation, which is um, a well-known uh, validating approach for testing in uh, machine learning. We for, um, perform temporal cross-validation for testing. Some uh, questions. Sure. So is, is the way to interpret this that every Bayesian node is going to have a real-valued output? Every, no, no. Some of them are discrete. Some of them based on the t type of node. Some of them are discrete. Some of them are continuous. OK. I guess then I didn't understand what you were saying by they're all Gaussian nodes. The continuous ones are Gaussian. The continuous ones the are Gaussian, but you also have discrete. Say, yes, like cross. Data? Yes. Okay. I'm going to show it. Okay. I have another question. Sure. When you say, I understand the method of tenfold cross validation, but only I've, I've only seen it used in other contexts where I understood what was the uh, criteria that you were that one was attempting to maximize, like classification accuracy. What's the equivalent to that criterion that you're that you're checking when you do tenfold cross validation? Okay, in our tenfold cross validation, we uh, compute the difference between the act. We have the actual profit, mm -hmm. so we want to learn a model to kind of uh, uh, to kind of find out what the uh, we we get the uh, a mean for the gross profit ratio, and we have the actual gross profit ratio. Mm -hmm. We compare them. We compute the mean the one that we get from the Bayesian network minus the actual divided by the sigma. We have the sigma of that. And it gives us some number on test set and train set. Right. And we can compare those and see that if, uh, if our Bayesian network is, uh, does overfitting, if, it's, if, if it does the same on test and train, we right. see that uh, th there's no problem with overfitting. And we show that the difference between the mean and actual divided by sigma is less than some number, which is which shows that it's a good. Uh, it's, it's a How does that check causality? Um, actually, the causality. So if if we can guess if with our network, a uh, gross profit ratio is a node. So if we get a good approximation of the gross profit ratio, that shows that shows that the network is a good approximation of the actual probability distribution of the variables. So. The profit is uh, the profit is um, we pr the prior knowledge says that the profit is the last node in the ordering. It can be it cannot be a parent of any node. It can be a child of. So we learn it. It's not the child of every node. We only add the prior knowledge that the gross profit ratio cannot be a parent of any node. Yes, but some of them are 
Some of them are irrelevant to the gross profit ratio. We want to find out which ones has more effect and which one doesn't. And then, yeah, then for naive Bayes, uh, it's apparent, but some of them may not affect it that much. And we want to get a good estimator. Okay, so for, to learn the Bayesian network, we use the PC algorithm. Uh, it's uh, an algorithm, uh, it's a well-known algorithm that used for learning the structure of a Bayesian network. So uh, to learn the structure, it starts with a complete undirected graph, and it removes edges based on conditional independence tests. Uh, so if uh, the data that we have is actually from a Bayesian network, and it shows the conditional independence test. And it's, if it's faithful, it means that it has a graphical model. Uh, and we have a correct conditional independence test. test. Uh, the PC algorithm guarantees that we find it. But usually, the conditional independence test that we use has errors. It's like a hypothesis test that if we check if it's correct or not. And uh, they have errors. And usually, the data is not, a from, it's not from a graphical model. So, uh, so it's not 100%. And we show it in the test how we test it. And um, so what it does is it removes edges. So for two variables, x and y, it says that there is no link between x and y. If there is a subset of variables that are neighbors of x, um, uh, such that uh, X and Y in, are independent given that subset. So if those two variables are independent given another subset of variables that are connected to X, we can remove the edge between X and Y. That's how we remove it from the undirected graph. So this is how PC algorithm works. And then uh, we, uh, in the PC algorithm, the second step is edge orientation. So uh, what it does is it identifies the V structure. A V structure is a structure like this, when there is no link between X and Y, and there is a link between X and Z and Y and Z. And what it does is if Z is not in the set that caused the removal of X and Y, we keep the set of variables that um, in the independent set test, we check if those two variables are independent given a set. We keep that set for those two variables. And we check if z is not in that set, then we orient the edges towards z. So we will get a v structure that uh, there is an arrow from x to z and y to z. And for the rest of the edges, we orient them uh, with two rules. First, we, want, we don't want to create a cycle. As I said, it's a directed acyclic graph. And we don't want to create a new v structure. So that's the two basic rules for edge orientation. At the end of this process, some nodes, some edges might, might not be, get oriented. We, use, we can use our prior knowledge to orient them, or we can use, orient them arbitrarily. It doesn't matter. And uh, if we don't have any prior information about them. And um, also, um, OK, what we did to improve the edge orientation. That is what PC algorithm does. What we did to improve the edge orientation is uh, we noticed that in our data, many times there are, uh, the, there are two or more V structures that we want to orient, orient. We can orient them. For example, if we have a structure which is like, a, like an N, and uh, in the edge orientation, what the algorithm does is it looks at the V structures in some order, and it starts orienting them. So if we orient T toward X and Z toward X, then the other V structure never matters. So what we does is instead of or, uh, orienting them by um, uh, a random order, we change the order to be uh, uh, the order of how confident we are in that V structure. We, because we use hypothesis tests to test the independence. So we know that how independent two nodes are. So how confident we are in removing an edge. So we sort them with the confidence that we had. So we orient the V structures that are we are more confident in first and then the rest. 
that improves the result uh, so far. So we tried it, uh, and uh, it improved the result. And then um, this weight that we sort them is based on the conditional imp independent test that we performed, which is a chi-square um, conditional independence test. It's called Fisher's Z test. Um, so I have a question. Yes. Why are you using uh, the PC algorithm, which does causal discovery? It seems like a much harder thing than just doing statistical modeling to get that. What's so important about causality to get the modeling versus causality? Yes. Um, because uh, we want to, at the end, the uh, purpose of this model is to uh, see what variables affect an objective function. And we want the objective function to be a, an effect node. We, want, we don't want it to be an, uh, a cause node. We want it to be an effect of some attributes. So that's why we use the causal Bayesian network. So I'm confused here. You're just trying to be predictive, right? You're trying yes. to eventually make the best thing that predicts profit, right? Yes. Because, okay, the business, what um, the project was, uh, the business department wanted to use this model to get some information about how they, uh, for example, can change some attributes and how the structure of the, uh, these, uh, how these attributes are structured in the Bayesian network to see how they affect each other. And it would be really useful for, the, for them if the attributes has a causal relationship. So they wanted it to be causal to get some information, some semantics from the variables. You're not just trying to make a predictive model, you're trying to make a descriptive model. Yes. Okay. Hey, I have a question about that one. Sure. If you were in charge of the business department, is that what you would have asked for? No. Insisted on a descriptive Actually, model? No. <laughs> <laughs> mm, okay. Uh, one question, just two slide, one more slide back. Please uh, give a few sentence description of why step two is the right. It makes sense. Why? Yeah. Why is that the? Why is that an intuitively? Step two meaning? Yeah. The, that. Two, why is that an intuitive rule for how to determine causality? Oh, the the this step, the whole slide, or what is really step just, two? If Z is not in the set, it causes the removal okay. of X Y. Okay. Okay. So if Z is in the set that caused the two nodes to be independent, mm -hmm. then Z should be a parent of the, those nodes. Okay. So, so if two variables are independent given another variable, that variable should be up. Okay. So if Z is not, then it can be. Then it, then it must be down. Uh, yeah, uh, if it's. Yes, it must be that. Why couldn't it be x is above z is above y? x is above z. The V structure, no, 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 the V structure, I mean um, uh, the oriented V structures. I don't know what an oriented V, I, I don't know what an oriented V structure is. Oriented V structure is a V structure that the two edges points to, so when we have no edge at the top and two edges points to uh, the middle light, the, to the middle node. Okay. So if we orient something that causes a new V structure, we don't. Okay. That's the second rule. And about your first question, if uh, if Z is not in the set, 
ux. So x, c, and y. I can answer you after. Okay, I'll get to talk to you later. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I showed this. Okay. So uh, another step that we added to the PC algorithm is to incorporate background knowledge. So um, uh, the background knowledge was what knows our cause, what knows our effects. The cause node, for example, here was a project type which we wanted to be at the top, and the effect node can be profit. And uh, those are the node and edge uh, restrictions. We have ordering restrictions. For example, we want some nodes to be in, in a total ordering of the nodes. We want some to precede the others. That's another restriction that we can add. And uh, the other one is existence and absence uh, uh, restriction. We, when we want to enforce that some node is a parent of another node. These are the restrictions that are given to us by business department. I'm not sure if um, it's reasonable to <laughs> add them, but they wanted to have those restrictions. They got some, uh, they found out that that's uh, what's um, important in their model. And, oh, yes. Confidence. In the order of the confidence. Uh, confidence that you had in the uh, causal importance of the edge. Um, so, what do you see as being the, uh, the research contributions of this work? Of the whole thing? Yeah. So, so like, right, the research, know. so we changed the PC algorithm a little bit to make it better. Mm -hmm. So, that's one research contribution. The other thing is combining. Um, Okay, this is an experimental work. What I uh, do in my uh, PhD is theoretical. And this is the work that I've done as a summer intern. And uh, what was uh, interesting in this work is how we can combine a Bayesian network with optimization and get a good result for some s uh, the combination of these two together. Okay. That's a, a contribution. Uh, okay, so uh, we added these background knowledge and we got this uh, Bayesian network. This is the thing that we get. Uh, so I'm going to explain a little bit about the nodes. So here, um, maybe I should have, okay. So we have, this, these are the nodes. This GPR is the profit ratio, gross profit ratio. The SPL is the project type. It's based on department, uh, the, pro the type of the project. They have diff 10 different project types. That's a discrete variable. The, um, then we have um, ITS hour, which is the percentage of time worked on the project by uh, IBM employees. If we compare, uh, there are some times that are worked with contract subcontractors, and they want to avoid that because they're expensive. Um, then the, we have skill diversity, which is the average number of the skills that the employees that work on a certain project has. Uh, they have a CI average, which is the connection index that we talked about before. We have revenue by duration, uh, which is the revenue, um, uh, we re divide the revenue by duration, we normalize it. Um, uh, then we have band average. Band is the rank of the employees. So band one to four is the percentage of time claimed by people from low rank. Uh, band five, seven is me uh, medium rank. And then the rest, there are 10 bands. There, uh, we, uh, we need only two nodes because the third uh, is concluded from the other. And we have band average. We have turnaround, which shows um, mm, uh, uh, how um, how solid the uh, what was turn okay so turnaround is the um, uh, if the employees changes during the time that's uh, a number that we get from how the team changes over time uh, we have PM project manager skill diversity and project manager time. Mm -hmm. And the uh, last one, which is the gross profit ratio. These are the lists of um, 
uh, the nose and was PM one percent negative influence on DPR? Yeah. Oh good. <laughs> yeah, actually it doesn't. It was really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so that's I'm surprised fine. that that wasn't excluded a priori. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has negative. Actually, there are 10 SPLs. I think it has negative for nine of them, or only for one of them it was positive. I, so that's what I remember. She so. get all of this business. <laughs> <laughs> what do do is negatively correlated. <laughs> that's correct. So then, uh, okay, this is the structure. So all the nodes except the SPL is, uh, is a discrete. Um, it's continuous, sorry. Only SPL is discrete. Then the nodes that are affecting GPR directly are these. So if we know the value of these nodes, uh, um, given the value of the parents, uh, this node is independent of everything else. And for future projects, we, if we know the value of the parents, we can find out what's the mean for GPR. And uh, then uh, we use this and we learn the attributes. To learn the attributes, we just, um, uh, uh, the uh, variables are uh, continuous, so we use Gaussian. And uh, we get the mean uh, for different values of SPL. So what we learned is, for example, for each project, we learned uh, four different uh, four different weights that we multiply to the value of the four parents that are continuous. And this set of weights and a constant that will be added uh, to get the expected value of GPR for that project. And um, uh, uh, these weights are different for different SPLs because that's uh, the discrete variable. So that's how, what I meant by saying that for different SPLs, that's different. I'm sorry, what's SPL again? SPL project type. Project type. Yeah. So there are 10 different projects. Yeah. So when you learn the location level, do you specify how many parents uh, nodes you have? Uh, What's the, the max um, the maximum actually we had about twenty no, we said we set it to the no no no. We don't uh, so put a maximum. Time. No. Yes. How does it compare to just trying something uh, like maybe a non nonlinear model or something that all the variables? Nonlinear model. So There are more than 10. There, these so are the relevant ones. Okay. Then use some, some regularized learning things. Could you try something like that, where you just try to predict GPR? No, we just tried to predict GPR. That's what we tried. Okay. We used a causal. They wanted causal. So. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. How do these business people know to say the word causal? <laughs> how do they, how do they con even know to constrain? They said that they wanted to get what nodes affects GPR, and they wanted, OK, they, well, we had a presentation at the beginning about Bayesian networks. That's what, uh, and we, uh, we talked about that a node can have parents, and this, is, uh, this shows a probability distribution and something like that. And they said that we want to be able to specify what node we want to be the parents of everything, or what node we want to be child of everything. And that's, uh, that's the, uh, adding a semantic to a Bayesian network. So to add a semantic, that what the people usually use is causal Bayesian network. Because other people in statistics, of course, can do really dumb, but these statistical tests on, on like weights that are away from zero, that's how they do deep bias statistics. They don't build causal models. Like you're trying to figure out whether cigarette uh, smoking causes cancer. You can in all of the, the possible parental factors and check to see if the weight is statistically significantly away from zero. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so you mean, can you, okay. Can so let's say a typical biostatistician when they're trying to figure out what causes cancer, they mm -hmm. know a whole bunch of things about someone, and the predictor variable, for example, is if you got cancer or not. Then you, 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 you do something like logistic regression, you have a bunch of weights, like 30 weights that can That's correct. all things, and then you can do tests to test to see if, it's, if a, a bit, one of the variables, is one of the, the, one of the links, one of the weights is statistically 
Yeah, yeah. So you can use the same Bayesian. Uh, if you do, do that, you can use the Bayesian network to predict if that's correct or not. Why use Bayesian network? Why not just build a, a regressor directly and then use statistical tests to just sort of whack out the, the things that are close to that essentially are zero, or that, that you could account for zero because noise and fluctuation. Uh, traditional statistical ratio. Mm. I don't know because b maybe Bayesian networks has a structure that is more interesting to them, and they can learn some stuff like uh, what what affects what and how they affect it. With, for example, they can look at the weights and see if it's negative. Then they say that the uh, um, the project manager, for example, involvement has a negative effect on GPR, and then. I don't know why they wanted this. So the edge orientations are on? Well, all the edge orientations is, re is relevant to all the edge orientations and considers that GPR is the, is the bottom node and everything else is the parent. And so like a naive base, you mean? Oh, naive you base is not. Uh, uh, you just go, uh, you know, what's the distribution of GPR? You do regression. What's the GPR? And you make all blue carrots, then you just you prune out anything that isn't, that is, uh, you know, a way that's statistically different, statistically insignificant. So then you don't get the structure between other nodes. But why do you care? You care about this. Then yeah. because it, it, they use they uh, learn this general model and then uh, they want it to be able to use it for other nodes. For example, if they want, for example, to here actually, I don't see. For example, if they want to use the revenue by duration and they want to put some constraint on that or see how it changes then they can use the same model. They don't want to use this diff, uh, another, they don't want to make another weight vector. And they want to see the relationship between every other node. That, I think that was interesting for them. Because when we gave them this, they wanted to know, for example, the uh, main question, they wanted to know what is the parameters of the middle nodes given the, their parents. And that was what they were going to use later. So. Instead of having, yeah, that's so what I. Can. Uh, do each of the parents independently cause the uh, the GPR, or it's a group of parents that cause GPR? Group of parents is cause. It's it's actually the probability of this node given all the parents is something, and not independently. Independently is like naive base, and you have a node and then the children. Uh, okay, so so these are the parameters that they, we learn for different SPLs. There is a, a, a different vector, and the vector shows how um, significant the effect of, for example, if the value is small, it shows that the effect of y is zero is not that significant, and if it's positive or negative, it shows that it has a positive effect or neg negative effect that can be used in Business department. Uh, so these are the SPLs to give you an idea. So there are ten different de des, uh, SPLs. So which is show, which shows the type of uh, projects. Uh, if it's uh, from server services, it's security and privacy. So each one has different SPLs. And uh, I don't remember which one, but only in one of them the effect of project manager was positive. So. Um, and then uh, we tried the database that we used uh, has 1700, approximately 1,700 projects. It was uh, the project started from 2004 to 2008. And uh, that's the pool of projects that we learned, uh, learned the data from. To validate this, we used this validation measure. We used the average of uh, actual GPR minus the expected GPR over the sigma that we get from the network. And uh, then we compute the mean, uh, we uh, do 10 fold cross validation. So we have 10 training, 10 tests. Um, we compute the mean of this validation measure on test sets and on training sets. As you can see, the mean uh, is uh, close to each other for test and training. 
it shows that we don't, uh, there's no overfitting um, because otherwise for tests it would be much worse than training. And uh, that's the standard deviation which shows that over that 10, um, uh, 10 uh, samples, 10 samples of tests and training sets. And um, as you can see, the, uh, this is divided by sigma, so it shows that the uh, mean GPR is uh, less than two times sigma uh, distance, uh, on average is less than two times uh, uh, sigma uh, difference with the actual GPR. This is and sigma. Yeah, uh, this is this, yeah. So this you could predict, say, maybe a billion, and you get, you know, it's, it's, it, what, in absolute terms, what, how, how well would you do it? Uh, uh, I'm going to show the graphs okay. later. Okay, so um, then we do the optimization. So to, for optimization, we un identify a pool of concurrent projects. So the concurrent projects, how they, uh, we define it as the projects that are started, that are, uh, that are running at the same, in the same month. So um, we identify a pool of concurrent projects. And for each concurrent project, we uh, have uh, the values of the parents of GPR. And given those GPR is independent of everything else, and we instantiate um, uh, a Bayesian network for each project, meaning that we get those values and we um, uh, get the formula for expected GPR. Now um, we have that, and the optimization scenario is uh, we assume that projects are staffed simultaneously, that the projects that are running at the same month are staffed simultaneously. And the revenue size and the number of people are known and fixed. So we know how big the project is and how many people we want to be involved in that project. We only, the only thing that we can change is the labor mix, which means that the, uh, we, uh, we, we know that we want 10 people working on it. We can, for example, put them on, from different ranks. This is the first, uh, the first uh, uh, optimization approach that we've done. We tried um, another one that in which uh, uh, we, um, we didn't assume that it's fixed. We assumed that uh, adding an employee from different ranks had some costs. And then um, we wanted to uh, have, uh, we know the certain costs that we want to have for a certain project. And then uh, given that we uh, learned how many people we want to, uh, from different ranks, we want to work on it and change the mix. Uh, so we can tune the mix, and there are two alternatives that I'm going to show in these slides. First is we assume that the actual la labor pool is fixed, so we have a set of employees that we want to distribute amongst uh, different projects. The second one is when we uh, have a number on the, uh, of the people that we have, but we can change the global mix. For example, we can have different number of project manager different number from different ranks and stuff like that. And this shows that what's the best technique to hire or uh, change the uh, global mix. So these are the two scenarios that I'm going to show later. And uh, the optimization, how it works is we know that mean GPR is a function of five uh, variables. And um, the goal is to change the value of some of these. So SPL is fixed. But we can change the uh, t uh, uh, percentage of time that uh, uh, is worked by I uh, IBM employees. Um, and we can change turnaround band and uh, project manager percentage. Uh, we would like to tune those variables to get higher profit. And the profit is GPR times revenue. That's how we define it. It's um, weighted by the revenue. Now we use uh, linear programming uh, to solve this optimization problem. So as you can see, this is the formula that we have. So we have expected GPR given the parents. It's this vector. So we multiply this by revenue. We know the revenue from the project. That is the estimated revenue. Um, then uh, we know we have some constraints. These are the global constraints that we have. We have constraints, uh, constra um, some constraints on 
the number of uh, IBM employees that we have. We have some constraint on the FTE is uh, an indicator for full-time employee. So how many uh, ITS full-time employee we have, uh, how many uh, people from a lower rank we have, and how many project manager we have. We have some constraint on those. This is the actual numbers that uh, were available, that were working on those projects. So we use historical data, so we add the numbers for those projects, and these are the actual numbers. So we, the only thing that we try to do is to redistribute the people. Um, so uh, yes. Using your causal model, those are three variables that you can play with because they're caused by other things. So in other words, they're constrained by the parent. In other words, you know, I don't know if that, if you go back to your basement, uh, uh, yeah, so like you can't, you can't, you, you, you aren't free to sort of tune, turn around. It doesn't totally depend on it, so. Well, I mean, that's what a causal model says. It says if you believe that the model is causal, then you, you can't arbitrarily change things on the inside because they're sort of at least influenced and perhaps directly caused by the, the probability of the, the probability of the whole network would be different, but. Actually, um, so if we uh, change turnaround, it will change, given this Bayesian network, it will change the uh, uh, joint probability of the whole network. But uh, turnaround is a variable that is tunable in our database because it's if we change the labor mix, it can change the turnaround. It but the problem. You know, actually, okay, so we can't, these are like the observations. If we observe certain nodes in a Bayesian network, it doesn't have any correlation with the parent. So it's like we observed these five nodes. So we can, we can change the, we can <coughs> change uh, uh, the numbers and uh, treat them as an observable node. So those are hidden and then we get uh, uh, different probability, um, uh, different joint probability for the whole network. It so it's like the whole point of having a causal basal network, Bayesian network, is you're trying to discover cause and effect, right? And if turnaround is an effect, at least, you know, perhaps weekly or statistically, of CI average and ITS hours, if it's an effect of something else, that means you can't arbitrarily change it. You have to change the things that caused it. Uh, right. Well, it doesn't seem like the levers are the parents of DPR. It seems like the levers are all the nodes that that have no parents, because then you can presumably arbitrarily change them. There's no cause of them. They're just inputs. The inputs to the causal network. Okay. I don't see why it's okay. We can change them. Assume that we have that each project is an entry of our database. Okay. Uh -huh. So we can, if we change some of these values, it's like we observe that these are different and these are, that knows we have the causal model that we learned from other projects and we can use it. I don't see why. So you don't think that turnaround is, if CI average, if CI average points to turnaround, that doesn't mean that CI average influences turnaround? It influences turnaround, but, um, uh, that's when we want to, for example, for find what's the, ha with, uh, okay, so the whole the, um, Bayesian network is when you don't know the value of turnaround, 
then you can compute the, uh, what's the highest, highest probability, what would be the value of the uh, turnaround, or what's the expected value of turnaround. But when you observe it, it's different. Necessarily seeing what could have been the value of CI average that would have caused that value. Right. So the one that actually is a little bit more troubling is it is assuming independence of ITX hour in terms of those are linked. Oh, those are linked. It's yeah. true. So that that's an even better example, right? That that you can't change ITX or you shouldn't change ITX hour and turn around independently, right? So even yeah. SPL. Uh, oh, SPL, we don't change it. SPL and PM. It's not like you can. It'd be nice. But here, here's a concrete example. It sure would be nice to fire all those icky managers and set PM percent to zero, right? Uh, speaking as a manager, uh, 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 but you can't do it, right? There's always some constraints, like oh, whatever. The CI average is low, so we need lots of managers to run around and have meetings, or uh, there's, you know, whatever. Uh, just trying to defend my job. You see what I'm saying? It's like you can't arbitrarily change the numbers. It, 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 that, that you can't. You, you can't just say fire all the managers. Well, I guess you could, but you know, uh, you, know you, you can't just say fire all the managers and spend no percentage of time on them. So what do you do? So okay, you say, yeah, I see they're dependent. No, 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 that's, we don't have those as constraints. We can add them, but we don't. Uh, Do they be linear constraints? No, some, no. They won't. So actually, I'm, I show that for, um, if we don't know the value of one of these nodes, then we need to sum over and uh, those value, and then it's not going to be linear anymore. And we need um, more complicated optimization methods for that. But. Uh, it's not insurmountable. Yes, yes. That was the next, actually, uh, after I left, that was the next step that they were, they were trying to do to add more uh, uh, constraints in optimization and change it from linear to be. Uh, to use to use the parameters to optimize the value of a node, but uh, if you change it, then it's, it can be an instance of a Bayesian network with a really really small probability. That's correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so uh, these are the constraints, uh, uh, and these are okay. Explain the constraints, and these are this is the uh, experimental result. So the first bar, blue bar, is the expected value before. So it's um, before changing any variable. And the red, uh, the yellow bar is the actual GPR average for a month. And these are the, uh, it, these are the data from, I guess, 2008. I don't remember. So these are for a year. And at each month, we average over, um, average, uh, uh, over the value of the GPR of that month. So that uh, yellow is the actual, blue is the expected GPR, and the purple is um, um, uh, is the expected after tuning the variable. And 
what we expected is that the yellow and blue were similar because that shows that um, uh, our model is a good estimator. And we want it, uh, we want it, yes. I don't get it. I mean, are you saying that after they, they ran it through an entire year and haven't changed all the variables in all of their projects to meet the, according to the optimization scheme? So for a year, they, they uh, changed, uh, so actually using this optimization scheme, they change the ITS over and project manager version for different projects and gets. Okay, uh, for a whole year, that they 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 redid their staffing strategy. Yes. Okay. So that's what oh, yellow is. No, no, no. Yellow is the actual. The purple is when we use optimization is, after use. Is purple hypothetical or? Yeah. It's a hypothetical, yeah. Uh, but yeah. but but does yellow but does yellow reflect they implemented the purple no. strategy and it just didn't work out that well? No, 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 no. <laughs> Yellow is the actual number, actual expected GPR. Blue is uh, uh, one that we get from Bayesian network, the expected GPR. No, 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 they didn't implement. Yellow is everything minus the research. So yeah. They, weren't, they were doing anything. Yellow does not incorporate any research? No. Okay. The blue and purple are what we get before the change and after the change from the optimization. So blue is your prediction of yellow. Yes. And purple is your prediction of how much you could help. Yes. And uh, did they implement that? And that's the okay, so that's... Many of them have been doing very well, so obviously the first <laughs> nice <and> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, so what, at the end, we reported this to the business department, and they, they were changing, uh, I'm, it was a bit confidential, but they were changing some of these, some of these variables based on the parameters, and they want to see how it turns out. And um, I, I was leaving the IBM, and I talked to. We published this paper in a conference, and I talked to my manager, and she said that uh, they are changing some attributes, and uh, in some of them they see help, so they. Uh, 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 they have a patent on this, and then they use some of these. They not totally change, redistribute all the so isn't that things. Isn't dangerous if you take a, a solution to a linear programming problem and you say that says change these variables and following the following you can have an optimum. And if they sort of say, well, we'll change a few, that doesn't necessarily lead to improvement unless you change all N No, actually, okay, they, um, this is... This is the hypothetical, and this doesn't show, because we didn't consider many other factors. There are many other factors that can affect this. They just wanted to see, that's why they wanted to learn a causal, because they wanted to see what variables affect the GPR uh, mostly, and how they affect it, if this, they have positive or negative effect, and they wanted to use those conclusions to see, uh, and to gradually add those to um, uh, their policy and see how it works. And it turns out that it works. I think as, as far as I know it works good. Yeah. Are all of these variables like, like PM percentage something that gets fixed when a project is undertaken? It's, it's not fixed. Okay. So help me wrap my head around. Suppose there's some hidden variable called project difficulty. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that difficult projects um, lead to both a high project management percentage and low profit. That's correct. And if I, ahead of time, say, you know what, we need to just not be managing projects so much, then I just fail at a lot of projects. Yeah, that's right? why I say that it's, uh, there are many other things that affect this. That's yeah. not all the variables. So there are many other hidden variables, and also there are, there may be some attributes that uh, we don't know about that can change this, that it can be observed. But these are the things that we get from experts, and they wanted to see how. Actually, what they wanted to see is that they had some. Uh, the experts kind of look at the data. They said they look at the data and they um, guess, they predict that, for example, this attribute will change the pro, uh, the GPR yeah. somehow, or this attribute will change another attribute. And they wanted to see in a network how this um, 
predictions actually works when we use statistical analysis. And they wanted to be, uh, to confirm some of those, for example, uh, uh, predictions with a statistical analysis to be able to use it in real world uh, service delivery system. And there are, there might be many hidden variables and also there might be other variables that we don't know about. They've got, here, they say, here are the things that we think affect this. There's some things that really affect things they don't know about. How could we design the model based on what they know about that could infer that there must be this extra thing that they need to learn about? Project difficulties. I wonder if that could be conceivable. How do you learn about the things you don't know? Well, you can't, you can't proceed. I know that. No, 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 no. Yeah. Well, you can you can often turn it into a into a, a, something actionable. Like, can I come up with a better criterion for when I should just not bid on the project? Yeah. Right, by just being able to classify uh, based on something like all the things that are known at project bid time, whether this is going to be high profit or not. I think it's over ninety percent of my research in my area. So, what is it that you? There are other things that we can observe, but we just incorporated these that are given from. So what is the total number of projects at which you ran? So I'm trying to understand. 1,700. Sorry? 1,700. Okay. So you have a good enough sample there to yes. answer what John was alluding to. Yes. So is there a way to determine that no matter how good a job I do in this, there will be these certain variables which are going to affect the outcome? So we can get meta answers like that. Uh, yeah, they might be here. Any other? So that's, um, uh, uh, and okay, another thing that they worked after is um, they wanted to, uh, when we, we can, instead of having these constraints like on the total number of people available as project manager, they wanted to change this constraint to be the cost of, for example, adding a project manager to a project because, for example, adding a project manager have a higher cost than having a low rank employee. And then uh, for each employee, we can have a cost of uh, him working or putting some hours on certain projects. And then we have a different set of constraints and uh, we'll get a different um, uh, Actually, similar uh, uh, ma uh, uh, function that we would like to maximize, and then we can use that. And w uh, we can also have uh, another uh, constraint for adding, uh, for ad hiring new employees, because we can. We, uh, the best, for example, strategy might be to, um, uh, to, for example, hire new employees in some level or um, uh, with some. Uh, uh, skills and use them in uh, the projects that are running, uh, which is a long-term um, optimization of, these uh, of the service delivery system. So this is the for actual staff, and we uh, ran another um, uh, experiment on uh, when you have no limits on, uh, we have a limit on the number of people that we want to work on the project, but we have no limit on uh, different mixes. So the mix of people can be uh, arbitrarily chosen. So this is what we get as you can see it's the average is higher than when we have limits on different mixes. And um, this is what they got and um, the um, whole idea as I said was to use um, these uh, the, the, the Bayesian network and the parameters that they'll learn to get business decisions on, for example, involvement of certain group of employees on uh, 
uh, certain projects or in different departments how they can change it and get better revenue. And um, uh, as I said, the cu current assumption was that both revenue size and the number of FTEs are fixed, um, but that can be changed. Uh, this, the revenue size and the number of FTE are what uh, they estimated, and the actual will be different, uh, would be different after uh, running the project. And uh, the question is how we can, we can relax these assumptions. If we relax some of them, if we assume that the turnaround or any other node is, not, is hidden, and we don't have the value at the beginning because we want at the beginning we want to have these values to get the, um, to maximize the GPE. We need to sum over those variables in the Bayesian networks, and that caused the constraints to, uh, the optimization to be nonlinear, and um, that's the next step for this. And uh, yeah, the, the optimization might not be linear. Uh, and they wanted to consider hiring, training costs, and et cetera, when they have to hire a new employee in addition to the pool of employee they have, uh, or uh, compare it with using a subcontractor. Um, so uh, we wanted to add costs. We add, added costs for some parts, but uh, that needs more work. Um, actually, it was last summer, so maybe they, they've done it. Um, and the conclusion is I wanted to extract levers. Uh, uh, we learned the uh, uh, structure and parameters of the uh, causal Bayesian network. Uh, then we perform uh, uh, constraint optimization to redistribute the resources. And we showed that experimentally it in can increase profit by a factor of three. But uh, as I said before, there are many hidden variables that we don't consider. There are many hidden constraints that we don't consider. That's for just a simple set of constraints, and uh, that's how we showed that it can work. Uh, and now, I, if I have time, I can. Asana gave me two topics to talk about, and I picked, and she had two talks, and I picked the one that was related to a more applied topic, and her thesis work is substantially uh, deeper and more theoretical, uh, but uh, uh, I've given the time, which is probably stop now, but as you meet with people, you make sure to tell them, by the way, way, that was not my thesis, here's my thesis, and maybe you can explain it. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I'll talk about my thesis when I meet people <laughs> because that's the work that I okay. well, works on for Any okay. last questions? Um, what's the connection between the Bayesian learning, uh, Bayesian interval for learning, and the augmented uh, test? So what, what's, uh, what, what's the information you uh, use to uh, use the optimization? The parameters that we, uh, okay, what, uh, the information that we use is what attributes affect the nodes that, the objective function that we want to maximize. It's and, feature selection, it. yes, feature it's selection it. and also the parameters, how they affect it. So we learn. In the optimization, you, you learn a different function, right? And no, 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 that's the function, that's, that's the same function that we learned from Bayesian Network. That's not a different function. Okay. something that is actionable that comes out of your descriptive model that you went back, assuming it's not confidential information that you can share with us? So, uh, like change this variable and it's under your control. You can do that. Something that is both actionable and where you can show that using a descriptive model actually helps you. So, okay. Um, what I know is uh, the, okay, the thing this is not, okay. Um, for project manager, that's uh, actually the was the uh, most important one because.
For one SPL, the effect of project manager was positive and the four others were negative. So, and I don't remember, but when we showed it to the experts, they said this makes sense because this kind of projects need um, to be managed with project managers and stuff like that. And um, they, are, they were going to put some limits on the times that project manager involves and distribute among the people. So I was slightly related to it. So are, were there a list of um, well-believed hypotheses that they wanted to test and this model either corroborated those or they have they have a list of hypotheses. They were like rule based. Like if we have this, then we uh, uh, it uh, affects it. But they I didn't know about them, and they didn't show me that. Okay. And we reported this back to the, the business department, and they were really happy with the results because they get some of the hypotheses uh, that they were sure about approved, and some of them yeah they were really happy about and the were parameters. They able to tell you something Um, actually, yes. So they didn't tell us about those, but they were some hypotheses. For example, uh, as far as I know, is uh, I send them the parameters for they they we were back and forth. They uh, asked me, for example, we had different models, and they wanted me to report the parameters to them. And then they were, for example, uh, said that this one works better or something like that. And then. For some of the, for example, some of the parameters, they want me to change some stuff and see how it affects, and they get some conclusions from that. I know that there, for at least a set of parameters, um, I know about it, but I actually okay. forgot. I don't remember what was it, but they were really inter uh, they, It was interesting for them, and they were looking into the databases, and there were some experts working on that, and then to see how it, how that affects it. Yeah, as far as I know. They were happy with the set of parameters that they <laughs>